Um, I have been doing this thing where I'm asking, well, this is, I'm saying I've been doing this thing, like this isn't just the second time, but I've been asking guests if they're comfortable uh, introducing themselves, uh, mostly so that I don't have to, after the show, uh, write, you know, I write a little, previously I've written a little script and sure. it's, it's a, it doesn't sound natural. It's no okay. good. Yeah. This seems sure. the better route. Okay, sure. All right. Um, so I'm Todd McGowan. I, I teach theory and film at the University of Vermont. I've written books on uh, a book called Emancipation After Hegel, a book on Hegel, um, a book called Capitalism and Desire, which is a, a psychoanalytic look at capitalism. I've written a book most recently called University uh, Universality and Identity Politics, which is a attempt to think about universality as the political position of the left, and a book on comedy called Only a Joke, Joke Can Save Us. And that's and so I, I teach a lot of classes on Hegel and psychoanalytic theory and some cinema stuff. And I've written some earlier some books on cinema. All right. Great. And you, you're also uh, one of the two hosts of Why Theory, which That's is a, correct. a, pod, yeah, a podcast right, right. I like a lot. Yeah, thanks. And uh, which has gone a long way to helping me understand Lacan the little bit that I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. Yeah, but particularly your recent episode um, on Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. That yeah, so, was, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm. I'm actually. It's funny. I'm teaching a class on Breaking Bad right now. So it kind of coincided with that. Yeah. That you know, uh, just the idea of the big other, the role of desire, and Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, it it just nailed it down to something I had a uh, I had a frame of reference for. That's really great. Yeah. So and 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 that that's kind of what we're mostly here to talk about today okay. is Lacan. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'll kind of give you some background of where I'm coming from. Okay, sure. Um, started becoming interested in psychoanalysis maybe two years ago. Uh, okay. After my graduate training as a mental health counselor, and you know it seems like in America in the 21st century. Uh, there's kind of a bias against psychoanalysis and that which does exist and is still regarded uh, highly is primarily uh, very rooted in object relations theory. For sure. Um, so the first I'm hearing of Lacan is, is not coming from the mental health world at all. It, it's mostly from uh, from cultural commentary, uh, particularly uh, left-wing cultural commentary, mm -hmm. and it's so different from what I'm kind of encountering as psychodynamic therapy and psychoanalysis, um, and really <laughs> foreign and hard to digest. Yeah. Uh, so... I guess, you know, unless there's some place you're more comfortable starting, uh, how would you, what's Lacan all about? Let me ask like this cheap, broad question. Sure, sure. I think he's, so the number one thing that he does is, I would say, I think the thing he's most known for is bringing the structure of signification and, and, and language into psychoanalytic thinking. So that's what he's most known for. I think what's most important about his thought is the way that he's brought a, a dialectical approach into, into psychoanalysis that is focused on the subject, focused on, I think this term lack is really the key idea for Lacan, that we are all lacking subjects because we're speaking beings. And so he links lack to the structure of our desire. So he thinks our desire is, struck, is, is lack, desire is lack. And that, that, and so to think about subjectivity in that way, is, that's, I think, the real breakthrough for him. So in a, in a time where a lot of people have tried to dismiss 
subjectivity is no longer important. So that happened in the late 20th century with figures like Foucault and Deleuze, and now it's happening with object-oriented ontology and new materialism, all anti-subject ways of thinking. Lacan's someone who insists on subjectivity, and I think that's attractive for a lot of people. That's at least in the cultural, what you just described as the leftist cultural criticism area. So so that's what I think is is really his, I think that's the main essence of his thought. And then he, he then develops a, an understanding of what he calls enjoyment and, or, or jouissance is the, is the French word. And that's really, and I think that's been crucial for a lot of people to understand why political developments go in the way that they go, that, that the way in which enjoyment gets mobilized is why a po- certain political movement succeeds and, and the way it doesn't get mobilized is why a certain political movement fails. So I think those... Like it seems to me around those terms of the desire of the subject, the desiring subject and enjoyment or jouissance, like I think those are the main poles of Lacan's thinking and that makes him appealing to people. But like I said, I think the what he's most known for is this structuralist focus on language and the fact that we're always subjects of language. Again, I don't think that's the most important thing, but I think if you just asked the person on the street, if they've heard of Lacan, they would have, I mean, the person on the street probably hasn't, but they, that, that's what he's most known for. That would be the first line in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Psycho- or Philosophy, I guess, that, that he brought structural linguistics into psychoanalysis. Okay. All right. So there, there's a lot of different possible paths that go down sure, there. Sure, sure. Um, the, the role of desire uh, to to me, in a lot of the Lacanian material, uh, am I should I be saying Lacanian? I don't know. I, I don't think uh, it matters because the you know <laughs> the, the term in French is Lacan, right? So it's yeah. I mean the name is is so I can't even say that. To, even to say Lacan and and you know it's fine. I think it's fine because his his son in law, who's the main inheritor of his whole philosophical oeuvre, I. I I've heard him speak a several times, and whenever he speaks in English, he says Lacan. So I figure if if Lacan's son-in-law says Lacan and doesn't try to say Lacan, then it, it's okay for everybody. I mean, I, I just think you know pronunciation's a fetish, so just pronounce it however. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but the role of desire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing that uh, on your podcast recently struck me as such an interesting. Uh, Lacanian idea was guilt being some kind of failure to abide by one's own desire. Um, It seems profound because, you know, traditionally and even psychoanalytically, I would think of guilt as some failure to live up to external right. expectations, um, things that have been brought into oneself, into, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that make up one's superego. Um, but there, there's something kind of intuitively real about, uh, that, that's, that struck me. It's like, oh, it's almost like, I feel bad that I'm not having the best time. Like I'm not using my time right. Am I approaching understanding that at all? Right. Well, so here's the the line is the only th- here's what he says in his seminar on ethics, seminar 7. He says the only thing that one can be guilty of is having given ground seated relative to one's desire. Right? So Okay. So I think what he means by that is that the feeling of guilt arises when, and this is why, so when you, you mentioned like these external authorities, right? Like when you capitulate to an external authority, guilt arises. And so that's mm. the sign that you've betrayed your desire, right? Like, so, so I think that's the sense of what he's getting at, that, that if, I should say that that's the only time he ever says that. And then he kind of, and he, he never talks about this sense of guilt ever again, but 
So it's it, a lot of people see it as a kind of a hapax, right? Like it, it just is this one, for instance, Slavoj Žižek says, look, we shouldn't think of this as Lacan's final word at all, that they're really, he develops. But anyway, the point is that, that it's when you have capitulated to some authority, you start to feel guilt. But the, the only reason you're feeling guilt is because you've betrayed your desire in seeking the recognition of that authority. So he really, I think, nicely opposes social recognition, which involves capitulation to an authority, with following desire, which is, which is, not, which is the, uh, at, at, at the opposite of recognition, right? So, so those two things are always opposed for him. So, and you, you mentioned earlier the, his concept of the big other. So guilt is totally oriented around the big other, and, 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 and th- that, that big other is the figure of social authority. And when one capitulates to that for recognition, that's why one is doing it, he thinks, then you're you're giving ground relative to your desire. So that's that's kind of I think what he is getting at in that in that famous statement. And, and not to get too nailed down in this yeah. in this one place, but so it's not so much it's not so much that failing. It, it is like bringing the consideration of the big other into your subjectivity is what sets the grounds for guilt. Now you have, uh, because, you're, because you're no longer using your own desire as a point of reference, now you have the ability to, to fail m- morally. Right, right, ethically, right, that's right. Okay. Except, except he, 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 the, the notion of your own desire, that's, an, that's not a Nilocanian notion, right? So, so he thinks your desire is always the desire of the other. So the point is that the other is divided. So when you're confronting the other, you interpret what the other desires, and that's how your desire develops. So I look at, for instance, I don't know, the group of kids that I hang out with, and I think to myself, well, what, it is, what is it that they desire? And, and my interpretation of their desire unconsciously then generates my own desire. And so that, but that is opposed to gaining their recognition. So that's the, that's the difference in Lacan, like the, that the, the desire is not my own desire versus the desire of the other. No, the, those desires are the same. It's desire versus recognition, that, that when I interpret the desire of the other, that's, that's how my desire develops. But then there's this whole other thing, which is gaining recognition and getting a symbolic identity, getting symbolic status. That's where the betrayal of desire lies. So it's in this, I want to get some kind of symbolic advancement. I want to be recognized in a certain way. And that's why guilt develops, because your se- that seeking of recognition is the source of guilt, he thinks. So is it like, okay, I want this fancy car... I, I, guilt would come from if I want this fancy car so everyone knows I'm a big shot. Right, right. But you, if you want the fancy car because you know the fancy car is good because your friend likes it, that is still desire. And that... No, the, see, that's the problem. The whole point of desire is that it's a desire for nothing, right? Like that, that there's no object that, that satisfies the desire. That's, the, that's the, his famous notion of the objet a, the, the mm-hmm. object small a, that your desire is, is caused by this object that you can never get. So, so it can't be embodied in a car or in a whatever, in a nice house or anything. Like that to follow one's desire is to, to, be, is to pursue without thinking that I can find some end to my pursuit that would be ultimately satisfying. So, so for him, there's really, you know, to like the investment in the nice car, the nice house, the nice spouse, like all of those things are, those are all like betrayals of desire for recognition. Hmm. So what is, what is that process then of kind of interpreting other people's desire uh, like, because y- y- you were framing that as separate from like an appeal to the big other, right? Right. So, so, for instance, like when 
I see, I look around, I see everybody trying to like get as much money as they can, which is, of course, I see that, right? Now, to interpret, like, if I just think like, oh, that's just, the, the, there's just this demand to accumulate and that's this what it is, right? No, but then that's not the interpretation of that desire because there must be some desire, Lacan thinks, underneath that demand for accumulation. And that's where the desire of the subject emerges. So it's not, so whatever is the explicit demand being given by the society or by the authority, by the big other, there's always some hidden desire beneath that. And that's where the subject's, the interpretation of desire takes place. Like it, it interprets what's like, for instance, like my parents say to me, I want you to always uh, clean up your room every night, right? Like, so that's their explicit demand, right? But Underneath that is, well, there's a desire. Their desire is that I, like, leave it messy every other night or what, you know, like there's some kind, because that's what they would do. They would not just follow the rules. Like, so when every, in every demand, think, think of it, I often think of it in terms of a classroom. Like a, a teacher gives a certain, like, I want this assignment done this day. I want you to, and the student who does everything perfectly is never the teacher's pet, right? Like, yeah. like that student is always like, you're like, wait a minute, you're a little too, something's a little wrong with you. It's the one that knows like, okay, I should, the, the, de the desire of the teacher is that I do a most of the assignments, but leave a couple of them undone, do a couple of them not so well, right? Like not everything perfectly. And so that's the, di that, that difference between what's demanded and what's, desired is really for Lacan everything like that's where that's where that's in a certain way the difference between consciousness and unconscious right like the whole like that's how that's why we're not just robots because the the commands that we're given are always there's always an unconscious desire beneath those commands and in our receiving of them there's also our unconscious desire not just our explicit how we're consciously responding So we, we always desire um, kind of like a limited sort of messed up version of what we're explicitly asking for. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. That our desire, like we're given, think about a, you know, I think this works even socially, right? Like we get it, we're driving down the highway, there's an explicit command, 65 miles an hour, Right. No one just no one just follows the demand. Like everyone yeah. interprets, it, the law is not the big other, but everyone interprets the law as not really meaning what it says, and they're right not to. Like right, they're right to anyone that goes just the speed limit. You're behind them. You're like, what the hell is going on here? Right? Like mm -hmm. you're. So that's because they haven't. They've taken that demand literally and haven't interpreted the desire beneath it, which is okay. Go a little bit faster. That's okay. Right. Like, and so that's true of every, in every social interaction, Lacan thinks that there's, there's an explicit demand and then there's an unconscious desire lying behind that demand. And that's what must, that's why every demand must be interpreted. Every command must be interpreted. Okay. All right. I, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to steer us back to kind of basics in a minute. Sure, but sure, sure. I, I want to stick with this for, for a second. Yeah. Um, oh, this might be... Okay, well, I'll ask the question that I... Not the question I really want to ask, because I think that will take us too far okay. uh, into this. But um, is, it, is it an ethical question, then, of... Okay. That's kind of how one should engage with others is by not taking them at their literal word, but it, it kind of interpreting what they're really asking for. That's right. I mean, although Lacan thinks that we do that unconsciously, right? Like that's mm -hmm. our unconscious response to the demand of the other, right? Like that's we we interpret this desire unless we're, I mean, it, it, in, unless we're like over like that that's that's Lacan thinks that's what neurotic disorders come from like failing to interpret and trying to stick to that what is commanded then you end up in a in some kind of neurotic position okay yeah trying to give what is literally asked for right right 
And, and, and that definitely, uh, certain pathologies, that's very obvious. Um, right. You know, uh, yeah, specifically, like I think of uh, obsessive compulsive symptoms. Right, right. I mean, it makes a lot of sense for obsessional, right? Like you're, you're, you're just trying to do everything like explicitly what's been demanded of you. And, and you're failing to see that there's like a, that the demand is, is, is meant to be interpreted, right? It has to be interpreted. Yeah, it's a discomfort with that, uh, with that space in which interpretation would, would occur. Right, right. So I, 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 I'm going to dial it back because, okay. uh, so Lacan I, I, I framed himself, his own thinking as a return to Freud. Right. That is very confusing to me because it, it seems so different and additive to 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 what I you know my understanding of of Freud, uh, what I've encountered of like Freud's actual writing and uh, his model of the unconscious. Um, to me, it strikes as an interpretation as of Freud, which I, I guess would be also true of all the other um, right. strands of psychoanalysis that that come into existence after Freud. Well, he, I mean, the the main thing he, the reason why I think he did that is that at the time, what he saw as dominant was a focus on the ego, and yeah. he thought that that was an utter betrayal of Freud's sense uh, that the unconscious completely disrupts the authority of the ego within the psyche. So mm. to me, it's, it's really a return to, the, to the, the, dis, the displacement of the ego, the priority of the unconscious, and the concept of death drive. So I think that those three things are really what he's getting at when he says a return to Freud. And I think the other thing that he thinks is that and it's true, you know, if you read, certain books make this clearer than others, and I think the, the, the three early masterpieces, so Interpretation of Dreams, Psychopathology, and, and the Joke Book, they make clear that Freud really understood the role that signification played in subjectivity. And I think that's what, so Lacan even says that, look, Freud, because he was writing before the birth of structural linguistics, couldn't have put these things in the way that I'm going to put them, but he already anticipates a lot of the insights that would come with structural linguistics. So I think, I, so I think if you think of it in those terms, it makes a little more sense. But I think also, for instance, like three quarters of the early Acre are written against ego psychology. Like he really, really has a bee in his bonnet about the way in which the 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 ego gets foregrounded in psychoanalysis, and he th sees that as a fundamental betrayal of Freud's project. So, when I see Return to Freud, I kind of think just that: like, move away from the ego, move back to unconscious, and the priority of the unconscious. So the the American ego psychologists, their whole view of uh, the the end game of psychoanalysis is to give uh, supremacy to the ego. Right. What is Lacan's view in contrast to that of what psychoanalysis means to accomplish in uh, the individual patient? Right. So I think the best way to think about that is this this uh, line from the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis by Freud, where he says, "Wo ich war, soll ich werden." Like where, and and it gets interpreted by ego psychology as where. The id was the ego shall be, just like what you said, like this, we're going to put the ego in char back in charge of the psyche. So Lacan gives his own interpretation of that, and he says, no, what Freud's really saying here is where it was, there I shall be. And so I think he's trying to say, we're going to take this, what I've, I've, what's been thrust upon me, psychically, socially, familiarly, and I'm going to make that the site of my subjectivity. So for him, subjectivity is the end point, not the 
mastery of the ego. And subjectivity for him is not a subject of mastery. It's a subject that's divided, split, and sees itself out in the object, in this, what we just called object A. So it sees its own division out in the world. Like it doesn't, it sees that it is, like he, he loves this phrase, I am that, like I am that thing. Like I, I have to realize it's a recognition of my own, you might say it this way, it's I, I, I take responsibility for my own form of enjoyment rather than just saying I've, this form of enjoyment has been thrust upon me. So that's, I think, some, and, you know, in a certain way, it maybe doesn't seem that different, but I think it's pretty radically different because it, 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 it recognizes my lack of mastery, but my taking of responsibility, whereas I think that ego psychology really wants to insist on my mastery over my own psyche. So I'm going <laughs> to, this is a very fun episode because, um, I get to ask for clarification a lot. Okay, yeah, and, good, uh, good. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say what I think is my misunderstanding of what okay. you just said. And okay. You let me know. Okay, good, um, great. So where the ego psychologist uh, would say, um, no, every place that the id is acting up and acting in the world, we are replacing with the ego who will operate on the reality principle and be able to navigate the world in this adaptive way. But what Lacan is saying from the same quote is, um, no, well, the problem isn't that the id is acting up. The problem is that the, uh, the individual is being acted on and acting in accordance with all of these outside expectations, desires that aren't their own, uh, and what needs to be replaced with all of that action, with all of that appeal to the external, is um, allegiance to the internal, allegiance to uh, uh, individual desire, uh, and kind of a, a natural, truer way of being. Is that... Rightish, mm, rightish. Okay. But here's what I, let me just amend <laughs> slightly, right? So he doesn't. Lacan fundamentally rejects the difference between internal and external. So, okay. so for him, whatever is internal develops through the external. So it's not like I can reject the external. It's that I have to recognize that this thing that has been imposed upon me, I have, I. That's my form of enjoyment. Like that's the way. I enjoy myself, so I have to take responsibility for this thing that is seems like it's external to me. So it's it's not it's not just oh I'm going to insist on what's internal because he doesn't the the difference for him doesn't really exist because my desire emerges through what's external to me. So it's not like I can rely on some true internal desire I have. No, there's no. There's no, for him, there's no authentic desire that doesn't come first from the other. So th my desire first comes from the other. So I can't, I can't assert some priority of some internal desire, right? So, but what I can do is take responsibility for that desire as my own, right? Like that's, and so that's for Lacan, the gesture at the end of psychoanalysis. Like I take responsibility, I say, that that's what I am. Like I'm that thing. I'm that. I'm that. And so, what I've take responsibility for what I've done, for what I desire, for how I enjoy. Right. Like I I don't look at a certain way of of that I have of enjoying myself and say, oh, that's just that's bad or that's I've gotten that from someone else or that's I I know I take responsibility for it. So that's that's what he's getting at. I think. So it's not so. Everything you said is right, like uh, except that notion that I'm, it's going to embrace the internal because it's not, it's not internal separate from external. Okay, so let me let me try this again. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So I'm going to be a good student and make my teacher happy, not because I want to make them happy, but because it makes. I, I, I get a kick out of it. Sure. And, and it, I have to make sure that I'm doing what I need to to get that kick. Does that Sure. That seems really good. Right. So, so rather than relying on this external authority of the teacher, 
right? Like you, you realize that this is my own, it's my own thing, right? Like it's my own mm. thing to, to, to please the teacher, right? If that's the thing that you have, right? So, so, so it, it totally changes the way that you perform in the class, right? Like you're no longer relying on that external figure for recognition or validation. Instead, you're confronting the fact, and this is Lacan has a very famous statement where he says the big other doesn't exist. And so it, what that means is, okay, of course the teacher does exist. The teacher really is there. But as, an, as a substantial authority, the teacher isn't there. And so that you really can't rely on that figure because that figure is divided just like you are. The teacher doesn't know what it wants any more than you do. Like when the teacher says, I want all of you to pay attention, the teacher really doesn't want you to totally pay attention. So all of these, like the teacher's authority, it has to be understood as divided so you can't rely on it. So that leads to the position you just articulated. I have to just rely on, this is my own form of enjoying myself, of finding satisfaction. Yeah, because it, it's an it's an act. I I I am uh, I am I lost my thought. It, it is about the act of receive uh, of of playing that of playing the Correct. good student of playing the getting a satisfaction from the teacher. The actual. You know, the other side of the dance isn't really happening. I'm, that's I'm right. That's right. That's doing the, the whole dance by myself. That's the point. That's the point. Right. Right. To not to realize that there's no authority authorizing your dance, if we want to call it that. Right. Like it just has to you have to recognize that it's your you have to take responsibility for it, even if it and especially that it initially comes from your interpretation of what the other desires from you. Right. Like it does, that. So it so it's not in, in originally mine. It's originally no one's. It originally it emanates from this act of interpretation that I in, inaugurate relative to the other. Yeah. Yeah. We the term other and big yeah. other. Yeah. Can you can you unpack those or it? Yeah, sure. So, so there's two different terms that are important. So the, the, the little other is just the, the people that you run into, right? Like just the everyday people that you're encountering. The big other is that figure of social authority. So it's not a political authority, right? It's not the president, the king, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a social authority. So it's I always like to think of these old teen films like The Breakfast Club or whatever. Right? Like it's the force of popularity. Like it is, mm. and and it's it, 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 it you know it's 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 exacting, right? Like it it has a certain it makes certain demands on people. Like wear these kind of clothes, drink, smoke pot. You know, like all these things that you have to do. Be athletic, get good, whatever it is. Like that's the talk a certain way, right? Like use certain words. Uh, like you have to do that in order to in order to get the recognition from that big other. Although the point for Lacan is the recognition never comes because the big other is inconsistent, divided, and thus can never be the source of recognition. So the attempt to capitulate to the big other is unend. It's infinite, right? Like you're you're constantly trying to. What is it the other wants for me? Okay, I'm going to try to do that. You do that. That doesn't work. You don't finally get the recognition you're looking for. So I'll wait a minute. I'll do this. And you te keep doing more and more and more things. This is like the way accumulation of money works. Like, oh, I haven't got the recognition yet. I'll accumulate another hundred thousand dollars. Maybe that'll get me there. But you never get to that point. So, so, or I'll get another degree, or I'll do you know all these things to get, or I'll buy this new car. This will really get me the recognition. Like I think all these things that we do in search of that recognition never get it because. Again, this the big other is divided. The big other doesn't exist. The big other can't, has doesn't even know what it wants from you, even though it does issue these commands. So it, it's the big other is the social authority. That's the force of conformity, just in a, in, a, in a sentence. And and it doesn't exist as a external entity or a coherent entity. It's something as a coherent to. entity. It exists right. in our subjectivity. Right. Right. right yeah. Right. And it has a social existence, sure. Like it, there, there are people that incarnate it. Like it, 
you know, like even in uh, even a, in, among my faculty, there's a certain number of people that are the ones that really incarnate the big other. Like when they speak, everyone kind of listens and 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 they sort of set the agenda for the department. Right. And, and uh, so they, they do have a, a tangible existence, but they don't have an existence in the sense that they know what they want, that they're they have a they have a that they have a consistent position. Yeah, they're like uh, just like a fractal of it. Right, kind. right, a fractal. Yeah, exactly. And, but also the little other doesn't exist. Is that right? Well, the little other is divided, right? Like everybody yeah. that you encounter is divided, right? That's correct. That's and like subjectivity and, and itself. The way you're relating. Oh, sorry. No, that's it. That's it. But the and the. It, the way they exist in your subjectivity when you're relating to them doesn't exist, though, outside of your subjectivity. You, that, that game you're playing with them of either trying to give them or deprive them of what they want, you're, that is... When we say don't exist, I think we mean doesn't exist as a coherent entity. That's right. That doesn't That's exist. correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, right. This and may then, or may not be an aspect of them. That's right. That's right. It could be just your own fantasy, right? Like that's the whole, that's again, part of Lacan's point that you relate to this little other through two mediating structures. One, the big other, like I always, my, my relation to the, to the little other is never direct. It always goes through the big other and then to the, to the little other. Mm -hmm. But it also is, it has a fantasy structure. Like uh, the entire way that I relate to the world is through my own fantasy screen. So that's very important for Lacan that that my own that fantasy structure determines how I what counts as important in what I see, right? Like so I don't know a, a rapacious capitalist looks out with a certain fantasy structure and only sees potential objects for accumulation, right? Let's just say the most sort of silly example. Um, but or a, 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 a sexual uh, a vehement sexual being looks out and sees only potential sexual conquests, right? Like that's all that really registers in that person's look. So that's the way in which the fantasy structure underlies what we're even capable of seeing, Lacan thinks, including in the other, I, what I mean especially is in other people. So we're, uh, just as people, we're all encountering one another, but like almost as visitors to each other's realities. That's that, right. That that's right. That's right. Yeah. That, 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 that's why Lacan really insists. And this is a change. So early, I think, so his first seminar is like 1955. He, he will use this term intersubjectivity, but then he banishes it. He never uses it precisely yeah. because he thinks we only encounter the other subject as an other, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're just... I'm just a little other to you. You're just a little other to me, mediated through the big other. There's no other, there's no one-to-one -one subject to subject relation involved. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, if it's all right, I might just throw out words I've heard and ask sure. you to yeah, go yeah. wild on That's them. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, this is, let me not do a word, but this is, you know, the, this is the phrase I think of most with Lacan is the unconscious is structured like a language. Right. Uh, I, you know what you, your show did a couple episodes. And we did an episode on that. Yeah. 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 We did an episode I, on that very thing. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. I, 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 I it's just, I'm not up to that level to have totally, yeah. you know, wrapped my head around it. So. Um, if you could bring it down to, yeah. to my level for a moment. Yeah, so what he means by that is that, first of all, it's structured. He's not saying the unconscious is a language. He's very explicit yeah. about that, right? So structured like a language means stru it's structured, first of all, that, it has a, that the unconscious has a structure that works through the same kind of connections that that work in language, right? Like that... That, and for him, the main ones are metaphor and metonymy. So this, the unconscious often will or is structured around a metaphorical 
replacement of like one thing gets metaphorically or more precisely, nothing gets metaphorically replaced by something. And that for him is the fundamental gesture of the unconscious. And and then the metonymic connections that make things, everything relate in the unconscious is for him really important. So I think in a way it sounds more uh, profound than it really is. Because I think in a way Freud already says that. Like he already says, look, in the unconscious, everything you know, when he says there's no no in the unconscious, what he means by that is that the principle of non-contradiction doesn't apply so that everything can be connected. Things that are disparate can be connected. And that's really what Lacan's getting at with this unconscious is structured like a language. So that's one of the cases where I think the idea of the return to Freud is really apropos because I'm not sure he's saying that much different or more than mm -hmm. Freud is saying. Yeah. I, I, I know he's not saying it, it is a language, but there, there is that early, you know, I, I remember reading, uh, I think even Freud might have suggested, like, it, it's best with dream interpretation for the analyst and the analysis to speak this, have the same native tongue. Yes, Because right. of all the plays and words and right. metaphors right. that would only be specific to that culture. Um, but that, that, that the, there's a poetic... Um, non-linear but sensible quality to the way the unconscious expresses itself. That's right. That's right. That's right. And and I think, you know, the, it's also true of jokes, right? Like the the last thing you learn in a, when you learn a language is how to make a joke or even understand a joke in the other language. So I think that that's again that because jokes so activate the unconscious that 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 it is rooted in the language itself, right? Like you you know, if you like if you undergo, and this is why it's almost true that people have a different psychical structure when they're speaking a different language. They just, and I know people who I I know I have a acquaintance who has one personality in English and then a completely disparate personality when he speaks French. So yeah. it's it's just fascinating because in English he's like barely speaks, very shy, and in French he's outgoing, totally friendly. So. That I think it, you know, I think it is true that it is that the psyche really, like the, how it's inserted into language, is really important for how the unconscious develops. Hmm. I'll, I'll jump to another one. Yeah, because sure. I, I yeah. don't have any a, any clear questions. On okay. That. Yeah. Uh, sure. When you talk about signifying and, mm -hmm. and the sign and the signifier mm -hmm. what does that mean in the in in the world of lacan right so a signifier so he he's very indebted to ferdinando sasur right and and sasur's idea is that signification is a structure without positive terms so that each signifier gets its signification not because it refers mm -hmm. to a thing but because it refers to other signifiers that it's not. So we know what a chair is because it's not a bed or a table, not because we have a mental image of a chair in our head, right? So, so that negative relation, negative definition of what a signifier is, is really important for Lacan, that a signifier is part of a structure through which we derive meaning, signification of the world, right? And so it's through that structure that we get we get significate we get any kind of sense to the world so that's so for him signifier is that part of a structure of meaning that 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 individual unit within a structure of meaning and and obviously words are the most obvious signifiers but it's very important for Lacan that other things can be signifiers as well right like the like, I don't know, I don't know, the Washington Monument can be a phallic signifier, right? Like it can be, like, or we can take, you know, just think how the Confederate statues in the South or even in the North uh, were, functioned as signifiers, right? Like they were signifiers of American racism. or And, you know, as long as they were understood as signifiers of, I don't know, uh, Southern pride or conf pride in the, in the, those people who fought and died for the Confederacy, they they seemed like they were acceptable, that they could stand in the public 
square. But as soon as they become, became understood as different kind of signifiers, as signifiers of racism, then they, they got toppled down. So, so signifier is the, the bearer of, of sense in the world for, for Lacan. So it's how we, how we make sense of things, but it, it is only has sense within a structure. And the signifier isn't like a tag that says this is this thing. It's a tag that says this is, here's everything this is not. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So a signifier is defined by what it is not correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's almost like uh, the opposite of like the, you know, the platonic forms. Like we have access to this prototype of what something is and that's how we recognize an emanation from it. It's no, we have access to everything else. That's right. And, and the word chair is uh, what we use to fill in the empty space when it's not a table or a stapler. Correct. Correct. I'm going to, I'm going to, well, okay. The, the real, that, that yeah. one is kind of a mind blower. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, go ahead. You know, I can just riff on that. Yeah. The, so the real is, I think, Lacan's most important category, right? So he has this tripartite way of understanding Existence, symbolic, imaginary, real. So the symbolic is the structure of signifiers. So that's, it's the most straightforward register. It's the one that every, like we all exist within the symbolic. The symbolic is what gives our existence and the world meaning, significance. And so without it, we would just, if, if, if we were stripped of the symbolic, nothing would, we, would, we wouldn't be able to function. We wouldn't have any idea of what anything meant. Okay, the imaginary is this what we see. So it's a world of images that, that, that get their meaning from the symbolic. So he famously in seminar one says the imaginary is hooked on the symbolic. What he means by that is the me, the image doesn't have meaning in itself. It has meaning through the symbolic register that underlies it. So there's a real priority of symbolic over imaginary for Lacan. And he thinks for too often, for too long, psychoanalysis prioritized images and the imaginary, and he wants to change that priority to the symbolic. Now, the real. So the point is, though, that the symbolic isn't uh, consist fully consistent, to go back to that word we used earlier. It's not fully coherent. It doesn't, and it has points of incoherency, points where the symbolic structure just breaks down. And that's what he calls the real. So He'll often use this term, an eruption of the real. So there are points where the symbolic structure breaks down, the real erupts. And you can, you, and this is why you mentioned the political importance of Lacan. This is why a lot of people really are drawn to him for political importance, because you can see different political events in history as eruptions of the real, like French Revolution, Haitian Revolution, Soviet Revolution, say, as these moments where a certain symbolic structure was going along fine, maybe had some contradictions, and then the contradiction explodes, the real erupts, and a change takes place. Like uh, geocentrism going along for thousands of years, right? All of a sudden, the contradictions within the geocentric system start to uh, make it untenable. Real eruption, shift to the new symbolic system, heliocentrism, comes about. So so those are that's how it happens politically, but individually, right? Like you what can happen is I have a certain symbolic universe. Certain things are possible within it. Certain things are impossible. The real is the impossible that can happen. So certain thing I don't like for instance, like I I'm let's say as much as anyone, I'm happily married, right? So I don't believe that my spouse could ever would ever cheat on me but i walk home one day and she's just there on the on the in the bedroom with somebody else right so that's a that would be an eruption all of a sudden it wouldn't just be that my my relation was breaking up it would be something that i didn't think that was for me psychically impossible actually happened 
And so that the fact that it happened would just would be shattering to me, and that would be an encounter with the real for Lacan. So the real is the impossible. The real is when the impossible actually happens. And Lacan's very fond of using mathematical structures to show how this occurs. Like he, he loves the way in which you put things in a series, and then certain positions become impossible within the series because a series, the serial structure makes certain things possible and then makes certain positions impossible. And that impossibility is the real. So whenever with that, and, and this is true of any symbolic structure, it always has this point of the real where the impossible is what seems to be impossible, but actually can take place. Okay. All right. So, I mean, you, you were talking about in dialectical terms, yeah. So, uh, to bring it back to that, there's a tension, there's a contradiction, there's a uh, thesis and an antithesis, and before, you know, that, that tension gets so bad, uh, well, so intense, and before it can become a synthesis, what elevates it to that is that eruption of the real, of the, 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 that, that the, the, the tension gets so bad it breaks. Right. Like the only thing I would say is I don't think for Lacan there's this kind of that, – that that's not how he would or I would define dialectics. But, but dialectics is the contradiction, right? Like the, the contradict – it's not that the tension builds. and It's that the contradiction is written into the very, if you want to use the term, thesis itself. So, so it, we don't require an antithesis to create a contradiction. The contradiction is constitutive of the very – thesis itself, whatever the symbolic structure is, it requires its existence depends upon this point, this contradictory point of an impossibility that can happen. So it's not that, oh, all of a sudden the things got so, no, it's because the, because the structure inherently has this contradictory point within it. That's the thing that, that actually create is the condition of possibility for it. I think that's really important for Lacan, that, it, that there's not, it's not first you have a coherent structure, and then we get some kind of trouble in it. No, the, the trouble in it is actually what makes it possible. So the real, it's not that you can, it's not the real comes along later to disrupt. The real, the disruption of the real is actually the condition of possibility for the symbolic to emerge in the first place. And that's what you meant by the possible impossible. Like that's that, right, that's right, that's right. The, the relationship already has the concept of cheating in it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I couldn't, there couldn't, even though I, it comes to me as a complete psychic shock, I, without that as a possible impossibility, I, the relationship never could have emerged in the first place. And so that is really, that's a crucial, crucial aspect of, of, of what he's thinking about. And... If I understand it right, we're kind of born into the real, and then and then then brought into the symbolic order. Is that? Yeah, I don't. I, I that's not how I would say. I know there are people that are Lacanian that would put it that way. Uh, I would. I think we're born into the symbolic. Like I don't think there's a time. I mean, for instance, like most people are named prior to their birth, right? And even hmm. if they're not. There's a certain symbolic space that's created for them prior to them emerging, right? So it's not like first you get this real, then you get the symbolic. It's like, no, they, they emerge at the same time so that they, they're, they're, they're mutually uh, dependent upon each other, I would say. So we only ever experience the real as eruptions. As that's birds. right. That's Never. right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So that's what I would say. I don't think there's this pure real first and then the second reel, although there are people that think that, again, I do not think that. I think we, we only have it as this point of disruption, point of impossibility. Um, uh, that raises interesting question. For what I'm thinking, like, do animals experience existence in the real? Uh, because we would think they have no symbolic order except ours. Um, right. I mean, there yeah, clearly are animals that do have our symbolic order, right? Like there are dogs that are, we've totally integrated into our yeah. symbolic structure. Um, I don't know about that. I, I just think that I, I, maybe that's true, but it's, it's also possible, right? That dolphins have their own kind of symbolic 
structure and i don't i just i, I just don't know that we know yet mm. but but yeah. but yeah i would say probably that's true that that they just exist in the real yeah which is which is something we only experience as primarily as as traumas right uh, right right yeah. right because even if it's a good thing it's traumatic in the sense that it in Freud's definition of trauma, right, that it, it, it overcomes my capacity for representing it, right? Like it, mm. like it, so even if it's, if it's a thing I really want to have happen, it's traumatic in the sense that it, 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 it gives me too much excitation that I can't find a way to, to represent. And so th that, in that sense, it is traumatic, I think. And the way Lacan, as an analyst, worked with that was talking about it until it was integrated into the symbolic order. Well, well, no, actually. Like, he, his idea was, we're going to try to isolate this thing that can't be integrated. So, so and, 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 and embrace what can't be integrated. So he, it wasn't a, a try, an attempt to integrate the real, because it can't be integrated, ultimately. So the point is to recognize... And, and reconcile oneself to these, the, the real, like the real, recognizing that the real is more you than the symbolic structure itself, right? Or is equally you. That, that's really his, that's really important to him. What, what is that? <laughs> like, I understand what those words mean, but what does that mean for the individual? Well, like... for the individual. So it would mean like, okay, so... I'm totally disrupt, destroyed by this infidelity, right? Like, I have to recognize that, inf that, that that infidelity is integral to my subjectivity. Like, that's rather than saying, like, oh, I got to find a way to integrate that, I got to find a way to embrace the disruption, like, to see the disruption as itself my part of my form of enjoyment. Because so, it, so if it, so the, this brings us to a different point, which I think is pretty interesting. That the, for him, I'm sorry, you cut out for just a moment. Did you say a part of my enjoyment? Yes, that's the thing, okay. right? So, so all enjoyment is enjoyment of the real. So, if I try to integrate this experience, this point of the real, back into my symbolic structure, I'm going to be eliminating my own enjoyment. So, I, that's why I have to see myself in the eruption of the real because that's the form of, that my enjoyment takes so so i can't i can't try to smooth that over or integrate it i have to embrace it like i have to enjoy i have to see that as the site of my enjoyment even if it's traumatic for me okay i i want to ask you about enjoyment a lot okay. but how does one enjoy uh, you know something so disruptive perhaps something terrible well, his point is that all enjoyment is has its source in disruption, right? Like, mm. like in the impossible. So, so that so that so that there's no we're drawn to it because it provides. I mean, we're drawn to this enjoyment. So it's not like we have to uh, we have to find a way to accept it because we we are inherently drawn to it. We're drawn to the things that provide us enjoyment that are at the same time disruptive so he's what what again he's just trying to say let's try to clear that path to integrate that into one's sub integrate the disruption into one's subjectivity rather than seeing it as this foreign thing that's been thrust upon me right like that's the that i think is the real nub of his whatever his kind of cure would be so it's um stop trying to get to this equilibrium where you're totally living in this uninterrupted symbolic order. You're human. You love drama. You love disruption. You need to be true to that or you're just going to be ripping yourself apart. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a pretty good way to put it. Yeah. That, that, you know, embrace the things that are disrupting your equilibrium. Yeah, I think that that's a good. I I, I like that. I think it's good. It's very French. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I've always been kind of a francophile, so maybe that. 
Uh, I, I think that offsets a lot of uh, because when you, in my early curiosity with Lacan talking to um, specifically therapists, uh, you know, uh, a lot of it is like, uh, it's, sorry, it's interesting, it's bullshit, though. and it's kind of this <laughs> francophobia, I think, a right, little bit, right, right, uh, right? Not in a you know like place coming from like a real chauvinism, but in a like discomfort with French thought and how. Um, Baroque it could be. Right. I mean, it's very, uh, just to, to, to keep to, to in line with what you're saying, like it's very much aligned with with Jean-Paul Sartre and, and, and existentialist philosophy. I think, I mean, Lacan is relatively the same age as Sartre. They knew each other. And I think he, in a way, they were kind of doing the same thing, although Sartre doesn't believe in the unconscious. But I think more or less, it's his... Lacan's version of psychoanalysis is a kind of existentialism, I think. Like, mm. a, in, in, in just in the way you were talking, I mean, that just the way you described it sounds very existentialist to me. Yeah, a kind of, I mean, you know, it's not Sartre, but the, with Camus and the uh, myth of Sisyphus. Right, like, exactly, exactly, yeah. right, right. Yeah. No, you can love that boulder, it's exciting. What an right, right. interesting story you're living. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's, you could see... Like the boulder is his thing, right? Like, and that comes back to Lacan's notion of dusting or the thing, right? That you're, that is the source of your enjoyment, even though it's the thing that that is burdens you as well, right? So, so I think that yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to me. So okay, I want to ask a lot about enjoyment because it seems important. Um, yeah, I think it's finally important. But it, it, uh, yeah, let's. You know what? I'm just gonna. Throw it out there. Enjoyment, okay. jouissance. Um, go for it. What's happening there? <laughs> yeah. So I think it's. I think it's like we were just saying. I think it's. It's. It's born of and generated through disruption, and it is. He says, "There's this great line. It's in one of the later seminars that I don't think is translated, but it's. He it says that jouissance is that without which life would not be worth living." And I think that's pretty a pretty good way to understand. So enjoyment is what gives our life a, a sense of like it's worth living to us. And and again, what he's trying to get at is that it's through it's through it's really through I think loss, sacrifice, disruption that we find enjoyment because it's not. And I think this is really important for him that the for him what we enjoy is always what's missing, right? What's absent. Because when the object is here and present, its banality, its banality becomes evident to us, right? Like it, it's, we, we realize it can't, it loses its sublime quality. And so it's only as absent. We, he thinks we elevate these different objects. He says we elevate, sublimation elevates an ordinary object to the status of the thing or dusting. And so that ability to, to find, to sublimate, to find a, a, an object that's absent as the source of our enjoyment is, I think, really, that's to me the way of understanding enjoyment, that it occurs through this act of sublimation that where we sacrifice some part of ourselves, some, we sacrifice, say, the utility of the object. We don't use it. We make it into this thing that's prized and absent like I, like to me like one great example of enjoyment is the collector right like the collector takes an object out of use and then enjoys it but enjoys it as part of the collection so it enjoys specifically not using it so that i think is a real like utility and enjoyment i think are one way to understand enjoyment is to see it as not utility like it's it's things are not being used okay all right they, they're not being used, huh? I think I got lost there for a minute because I got I got stuck on what I initially thought I was understanding. At okay, point. what did you initially, and then we'll <laughs> kind of work from there. <laughs> um, that it's almost like want. Oh, like the prescription, the prescriptive form of it would be want something you can't have, so you can have so you can have a sustained disruption. Uh, of which you can have that uh, that I, I'm using the term drama because it feels yeah, correct yeah, to me yeah, yeah. that that you can sink your teeth into 
Well, that's um, the capitalist form of enjoyment, right? Like mm. once something you, you know, always strive for what you can't have. But, but I think Lacan would say, look, you don't have to, you don't have to want something you can't have because everything that you can have, you also never really get, right? Like that's mm. the point. Like, like for instance, I think you can think of a relationship this way, like, right? Like there's, there's always, you can enjoy a long-term relationship with someone. Why? Because there's always part of them that's inaccessible to you, right? Mm. There's always something that's inaccessible. And, and, and it's that absence that what's inaccessible is that's what you're enjoying when you're, when you're with them. So mm -hmm. the, even, the, even the things that are present for you are the things that point to this, this thing that's absent that you don't have access to. And so that's, that's what you enjoy when you're, when you're with the person. I think so that that that's for me one way to think of it like you I mean or people I think people I mean one major form of enjoyment is religion right because it's precisely God's absence that they enjoy right if God was actually present as a I don't know whatever a leader of a country that God wouldn't be enjoyable in the same way like it's the absence of God as a as a physical being that that makes that figure of God enjoyable for them. Let me ask a stupid question. Uh, sure. Why are we like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think what Lacan would say, because he's a structuralist first and foremost, is that because we're beings of language, right? Like mm. he thinks that he thinks that if you're not a being of language, you can find satisfaction in obtaining the object, right? Like a let's say a lion eats a gazelle; it's just satisfying. But if I eat a pizza. As I'm eating the pizza, I think like, wow, I really, I can't, this is going to be done soon. That's mm. too bad. <laughs> and like my enjoyment of the pizza is actually linked to what is not there. Or I'm thinking like, wow, I can't wait to have that piece of cake for dessert as I'm eating. You know, it's like, it's impossible to just enjoy the pizza as object and find satisfaction. And then, and then the point is that for the lion, like once you've eaten the gazelle, you're just satisfied until you're hungry again, right? But for the for the human, and this is why we can be, he thinks we can be, you can overheat because you 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 you're you're sated, your need is sated, but your desire is never sated because you're a being of language. I think I think he would say it's the development of this parasite on us of language that has turned us into this. And the the way to reckon with that is to be like, okay, you also have to savor the 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 want for what you lack. That's right. That's right. So if you think of, like the way to adjust, it's a little too conformist for me to say it like that, but whatever. The way to to make do with our the excesses of our being in language is is to realize that these excesses have to be tied to what we lack. Right? Have to be tied to what's absent. And then, then that, that allows you to not, I mean, just to put it in a kind of stupid metaphor, it allows you to avoid overeating, right? Like it allows you to see that even when you're not, when you're, when you're lacking the thing, you're, st that's a way of, that's your way of enjoying it. Like you're, that's the only way you have of enjoying it. So it's a kind of a, I don't know, kind of like a, in a way like anorexia as a model for understanding enjoyment right like you're eating you understand that you're always eating nothing right and that's the that's really the 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 way to make sense of your enjoyment the you you're eating the frustration that's right that's right yeah and then it ceases to be frustrating right because you see that like what i'm actually enjoying is what's not here and so i don't have to be constantly thinking like how can i make how can i bring this thing that i don't have here if i know that i only can enjoy it in its absence right like then i then i i i kind of overcome that need to constantly accumulate more i mean i think in a way it's a very anti-capitalist kind of thinking because it's anti you know like capitalism has been upon bringing making more things present to me Right. Mm. And, and, and Lacan is about recognizing the enjoyment through what's absent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, this is 
you know, I'm, uh, I'm in my mid thirties. I'm, so I'm a millennial. Uh, and I think about, I grew up playing video games and, uh, I occasionally still do. And they're so advanced now. And, um, so much less fun than they were in like really kind of hitting a sweet spot in the early 2000s of just being a little clunky and right just fun enough but like you could see the next step that it wasn't at yeah 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 that i mean that's a great it's a great example really right like that that it's it's the very imperfections of that the little clunkiness of the video game that provide, that make it a source of enjoyment, then when it gets too perfect, it actually no longer provides the enjoyment that it once provided in its imperfect or, or clunky, clunky form. And I, I think that's really, really good. That, that, and, I, and, you know, it's a way to actually, I mean, I don't think you even know, need to necessarily go to analysis to do this, but it's a way to think like, oh, okay, the imperfections of my, whatever car say are the things that I enjoy about it. Cause I don't have to worry about keeping it perfect. Like if I get a little dent, it's fine. So, so this, this idea that the, or like the imperfections of my partner, like the, to see the way in which the imperfections are integral to what I love about that person. So I think that's real. There's a really a kind of a, almost a practical, many people have said this to me, there's like a practical self-help component to what Lacan is is saying and I, I I think that is true like there is a way to kind of reorient yourself around the imperfections or the failures or the things that seem like they detract when they actually are constitutive of the value of a thing mm. Mm. okay um, you know I don't <laughs> there's what that means in practice that uh yeah what does that mean just enjoy it just enjoy it for what it is with all right. of its frustration yeah i think you have to reinterpret the frustration right like you, you yeah and i think it makes you less frustrated i think it really does like you like let me give you an example so my my spouse she doesn't do it so much anymore, but she used to always leave the lights on in every room. And I would just, it would drive me crazy and I would get angry and frustrated. And then I realized like the fact that she doesn't care about our electric bill is integral to the fact that she cares a lot more about people and like how people are doing rather than like these stupid things and how much money. And so then I realized like, well, that wait, that's what I, that's really what I love about her. So like yeah. I see the way in which what's lacking is also what creates this excess that is what's what I love and what I enjoy about her. So I think that that's just a really practical kind of example. You've been pissed at me for saying this, but, well, but I know. I, I listen. It actually sounds very sweet um, because even that you know you're describing your wife as kind of having this real kind of altruistic, you know, exactly, uh, exactly, uh, right. Uh, and, um, but um, that's like an imperfection, like from, from like the idea of a person. Right. So exactly. Exactly. When you're looking at that, yeah, she, she forgets, yeah, she's not good with the, the, uh, with the lights. Uh, it's like, oh, I'm just seeing the other side. The, I'm seeing the other side. That's right. Of that that's indent. right. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I love that way of looking at it. Like, it's like a dent in the person. Are you looking at the dent, or are you looking at it from the other side, and then it looks like so, uh, an excess that's a that's a that's a benefit, right? Like it. So I think you have to see the way in which both those things are operative. That I think that's really, to me, that's one of the best practical things that's happened to me from from engaging with Lacan. I have to say. Yeah. And enjoyment. Enjoyment is very present in political eruption. For sure. That makes sense in that political eruption, in, for good or ill, comes from a place of we are, in, we are not in what we want to be, the situation we want to be, and we can imagine it. And right. it's a reveling in that frustration. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right, I think that's right, that... 
tell them it's real. I really like that way of putting it. That that many political like the to me the Trump movement is all about enjoyment, right? Like it's all about how he is so good at mobilizing not just the enjoyment of the right, but the enjoyment of the left too. Um, and 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 it's all and, and it's never about really changing the structure, right? It's about finding a way to enjoy the thing that's that that threatens us, right? So so I loved the way in which so I think it was in the 2018 midterms, all of a sudden there was this caravan of Central Americans coming up through Guatemala, Belize, right. Mexico. Uh and 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 you know fastidiously covered by Fox News. And then the election took place and then that, that caravan just just disappeared. Like it just was no longer yeah. of any interest at all. And so I think it was fascinating for me because it just showed that the threat was necessary for the form of enjoyment, right? Like the threat, we, th we enjoy the threat. And so I think that's what a certain kind of enjoyment, what I would call right-wing enjoyment requires this enemy threat to be, you know, a, a threatening to take us away our form of enjoyment. And that's the only way that our form of enjoyment is actually a form of enjoyment for us. That if it's not under threat, if it's not threatened to become absent, then it's no longer, it's not, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing enjoyable about just being American, right? Like it's just nothing without this threat to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and you said even, you know, uh, in the, with the Trump presidency, it also, mobilize the enjoyment of of uh the left specific i mean you could even think of the the real like kind of least radical center left um starting to use all of this imagery of resistance and things they were obviously very much getting excited to use incredible yes incredible yeah. i mean i think that that probably the the even bigger threat to the country than Trump was the way in which the all the opponents to him enjoyed him so much right like it's almost like he got fantasized into existence i i i sort of think like he like he really and all of his all of his transgressions fit within a certain fantasy space of what is the thing that we most are abhor right and so we want to create this thing that we most abhor and we're going to and so we can continue to abhor it. So I think that that's really, I think that to, underst to, to make sense of what's happening now politically, I think almost requires some concept of enjoyment. It's not just an added thing. It's like that is the thing functioning, especially you know, today. I, and I'm not the first person to point out he has some history in, with uh, dealings with professional wrestling. And, right, 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 yeah. right, right. Which is a, which is a putting pr enjoyment on the stage, right? Like it's showing us these forms of enjoyment right yeah 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 people love to see the villain right it's, right yeah. yeah it gives definition to what they're doing what you're doing right i mean it's a fundamental i think it's it, 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 like we were just talking about the relationship between enjoyment and absence right like it makes what you have potentially absent so you are actually enjoying its absence while you have it when you have this villain threatening to take it away. So I think that that's like the notion of the enemy is absolutely central to a certain kind of form of enjoyment, which I think is pretty toxic. That kind of the enjoyment that relies on the yeah. enemy or the villain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the flip side of it, uh, left wing enjoyment might be frustration with the status quo, frustration with not getting to some horizon. Right, but I think I, 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 yeah, that's okay. That would be the that, I would call that a something like a deformed form of left wing enjoyment because I okay. think a genuine left wing enjoyment is is kind of what Lacan advocates, like enjoying that what's absent because what's absent is, and I think this is really important that what's absent is what we all have in common. So it is. Mm -hmm fundamentally egalitarian and universalist that that we're all tied together through this through what through lack so and and that enjoyment of absence is not it's not like some people can get it and some people can't it's available to everyone so i think to me 
this the opposition between right and left enjoyment is precisely this enjoyment of of absence versus this enjoyment of the enemy right like that's the that to me is the right wing form of enjoyment so i think that to me that's really that's how lacan is really helpful for thinking about a political situation but for that more like perhaps healthy version of a left wing enjoyment wouldn't yeah. that only really be possible in a society that's met a lot of a lot of the you know left wing no, aims okay no i see why you're saying that tom but i don't think so like i think that because i think that the in a way the the whole point we were talking about this earlier is the struggle towards it right like the whole that enjoyment doesn't exist outside like it, it, it is the struggle to for equality that is already the enjoyment it found in that enjoyment of absence so i don't think it's i don't think it has to be achieved i think it's in the struggle for it that that enjoyment gets accessed but that struggle for it implies the frustration right or, right, right. Or, no it's frustrating yeah. sure sure yeah yeah and that frustration you could draw enjoyment from right 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 um, and this is what Jewish science is. Right. To me, to, for me. Yeah. I think that's how I interpret it. I don't want to take up a ton more of your time. I'm not sure what your, uh, what, what your availability is. Um, within the, the real, that even gets broken down a bit. There's the real the real real and is it the imaginary real something like that well well slavoy does that lacan never does okay. that so yeah yeah right. I, I i should go soon but um but yeah um so i'll just go through what slavoy does so so the symbolic real would be the real that i was talking about these this the way in which there's a certain like say um say uh the system of whole number or yeah like say the system of whole numbers right so the square root of, or a system of natural numbers, the square root of negative one would be a symbolic real within the system of natural numbers, right? Because it's, it's, it, it has no, there's no natural number answer to it, right? Um, yet it's a function you can perform within that system. So that would be the symbolic. Now, the, the imaginary real would be like alien, right? Like some kind of image of a thing that's so disruptive, we have no way to make sense of it. So that's the, that's the imaginary version. And then the real version would be the way in which we recognize our desire within some kind of scene. Like, let me, I don't know if you've seen the movie Psycho, but there's a great, this is Slavoj's example, there's a great point in Psycho where Norman Bates has cleaned, the, the, the murder's taken place, he's cleaned up the bathroom and he's getting rid of, of of uh, Marion's car, and he he puts the car into the swamp behind the hotel, and it starts to sink down, and then it it stops for a minute, and he looks like, oh my God, the car's not going to go down, and and Hitchcock makes us as spectators aware that we are invested in him covering up a murder, because mm. we're all like, oh, I hope that car goes down and he doesn't get caught. So that would be real, real, like that. That's this real of our desire manifested itself. But but again, that. For Lacan, those aren't three different things. That those are for Lacan. That's just there's just the one real, and that's just Slavoj's way of trying to further differentiate things. Can I ask about one more sure. broad? Thing? Sure. Uh, sure. Lacan's take on the Oedipus complex and the phallus. Uh, I remember, like a, maybe two years ago, watching a video about it and being and just his different take on what the phallus is and being like this is the first thing i've understood at all of yeah. anyone talking like that uh, the, it's co coherent enough for me to just like decipher yeah. um i don't remember what the video said so i i'm <laughs> okay you asked me yeah 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 so phallus for lacan is a signifier right that's very that's the crucial thing that it's a signifier, and it's the signifier of symbolic law. So it's the signifier that grounds, it's the master signifier for him, it's the signifier that grounds the symbolic structure. As a result, it always, it's always the phallus at work in what seems like phallic 
uh, or, or, or male privilege, right? So, so he thinks his fundamental understanding of male subjectivity is that it's a fraud because the phallus is a signifier that signifies ultimate power, but it really doesn't have it. So that's the real, I think that's the key aspect of this notion of phallus for him, that it's, it's, it signifies potency, but it's really impotent. So it, it's, it's hiding its own, it's a signifier that hides its own impotence, just like male subjectivity proclaims its potency, but then is fundamentally impotent. That, that Lacan thinks that symbolic castration applies across the board, but male subjectivity is a denial because it says, I have the phallus, right? Like that's the, the assertion of male subjectivity. And, and no one can have the phallus because the phallus is a symbolic structural position. So for him, male subjectivity is fundamentally this lie that hides its own impotence. And he, he sees the phallus as the signifier of impotence. So we're, we're all castrated because we're all subjugated to Speaking external beings. authority. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, and... Uh, uh, we all desire to have the phallus, and part of male subjectivity is this playing at having it, even Correct. though Correct. there's an understanding that one doesn't. Right. I mean, I don't think a lot of men understand that they do, but some do, right? Like, I think a lot yeah. of men think that they really have it, and one way they try to assert having it is through, like, driving a nice car. Another way might be having a lot of women conquests, right? Like, all these things about accumulating a lot of money, all these ways of asserting one's felicity. But they're all, for Lacan, they're yeah. all signifiers of impotence. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I'm not going to ask any more questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, this has been super helpful. Oh, to Tom, great. It it's been so fun talking to you. Thanks. Is there anything um, you'd like? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to link to I'm going to link to Y Theory. I'll link to your sure. YouTube channel. Sure. Uh, is, is there anything else you'd want listeners to know or to look out for? Uh, no, nothing to plug. Just uh, you know, I hope they read a lot of Lacan and, and Freud. Oh. That's the. <laughs> And I, I think this would be a good primer. I, it's, I, 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 that's how I'm going to use it. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Right. Great talking to you. Th thanks take so care. much. Have a good okay, rest of your care. day. You too. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please like and subscribe. And if you're listening on a podcast app, please leave a rating. It helps a lot. Thanks. Thanks.